Hey everyone, today I'm making a video critiquing an internet evangelist who has a YouTube channel called Need God. Now the reason I am making this video is because I just kind of through happenstance stumbled upon a video that this gentleman had with an Eastern Orthodox Christian. And in this video, Need God is trying to convert the Orthodox Christian because Need God thinks he's going to hell. Um, Need God apparently thinks Catholics and Orthodox Christians, along with many other confessing Christians, we're all going to hell. Um, and when I say we, I mean this in a kind of generalized sense. That's not necessarily me saying I'm in one of those categories. Um, he thinks they're all going to sell. All, all, everyone's going to hell, essentially. Um, and he is spreading what I view as a, a an objectively false gospel and one not that is not only false but is dangerous now and this gentleman has a very sizable youtube following he has close to ninety three thousand subscribers his uh, channels gets lots of views his uh, live streams get lots of views and so i see him as spreading really just objectively dangerous um information about what it is that um, you know christianity teaches and so i'm i'm making this video and we're going to go through some clips of him and describe um, where he goes wrong. Now, I want to begin this by saying, unlike need God, uh, need God I, I don't think he's going to hell because he's wrong. I, I think he's a Christian. I'm not going to question his salvation because I disagree with him with doctrine. Um, and it's a shame that he doesn't extend this level of charitability to other Christians. Um, but we'll, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so why do I think that he's preaching a false gospel? I think he's preaching a false gospel because he is, he is adding on to what Jesus says one has to do in order to be saved. What does Jesus say you have to do in order to be saved, eternal, uh, inherit eternal life, all that. You have to believe in him, right? You have to put your faith in Jesus. Uh, we get that pops up in, you know, the epistles and things like that. And then Jesus himself explicitly says in the famous John 3:16 verse, um, you have to believe in Jesus, right? Believe in the son and um, you'll inherit eternal life. Not too complicated. It's pretty simple. Now, need God would say that he agrees with all that, but he actually doesn't. What he thinks is you have to believe in Jesus and have perfect theology. You have to have certain beliefs about how it is that Jesus saved you, and if you don't have the right ones, <laughs> you're going to hell. You have to have correct beliefs about the role of baptism, the Eucharist, and the sacraments and things like that, and if you get any of those wrong, you're going to hell. And I'm not misrepresenting him here. Let me show you a couple of verses just so you can, uh, just so we're all on the same page that I'm not misrepresenting this guy. My view on salvation is that we all need it because we're all wretched sinners who should be in hell. And the only way we can be saved is through what Christ did on the cross, received as a complete free gift by us through faith alone and not by good works. And Jesus pays for all of our sins, past, present, and future sins, if we are trusting in Jesus. Otherwise, if we're not, we end up in hell. Just going to pause here briefly. So far, this is just a pretty generic, um, penal substitutionary, kind of reformed Protestant understanding of the gospel. I think this is wrong. Um, I think his understanding of, of atonement is wrong. I can get into that in a little bit. But I just want to pause here by saying, so far, besides what I think are some incorrect understandings of the atonement, he hasn't said something really egregious yet, or at least not something that I would say, oh, this is a really dangerous false gospel. That's coming up next. Enough, or keep God's law enough, or whatever it is, it would have to just be a free gift and I receive it then just by faith, Ex trusting in my mind that Jesus has already taken the punishment for all of my sins. Okay. Did everybody catch that? So faith just is trusting that Jesus took the punishment for your sins. So the insinuation here is that if you don't think Jesus was punished for your sins, apparently you don't have faith and you're going to hell, okay? So when he's saying this, well, actually, let me show another clip just so you can show that this isn't just a one-off thing from him. Look at this other clip. It's a promise he gives to anyone who will believe. He's taken the punishment for your sin, therefore no punishment left. The only place you can end up is, end up is in heaven, if that's what you're believing in. Again, you will end up in heaven if what you're believing is that Jesus was punished for you. Anyone who thinks salvation occurs in any other way, straight to hell, even if they believe Jesus is God, even if they submit their life to him, even if they're obedient and loyal to him, even if they believe and put their faith in Christ, if they think 
that the way Jesus brings about their salvation is through a different mechanism or through a different model than this penal substitutionary story, this guy thinks they're all damned to hell. And this is not what Jesus taught. Jesus didn't say, believe in me and believe a very specific view about how I'm going to save you. In fact, Jesus could not possibly have meant that. And here's how we know why. Is Jesus explicitly tells a woman that her faith has saved her before he's even died. Well, if faith involves having a specific view of what it is that Jesus' death and resurrection and all that accomplishes, if you package in having faith in Jesus to having a specific conception of Jesus' work, that woman couldn't have had faith. She, like, he hadn't died yet. She didn't, she didn't have all this theology. Rather, he says she has faith because she was being loyal to him. She was putting her trust in him. All these kind of buzzwords. And I'm going to make a small remark here that this guy takes faith and belief to be just kind of just, oh, just trusting in or um, this kind of loose sense of just trusting or acting on trust. However, I'd point out that there's a decent argument to be made that these words that we translate as faith and believe, the meaning behind these is something more akin to fidelity loyalty. You were saved through loyalty to, in Christ or fidelity to Christ. That's what the idea of faith is. I'll put a, a book on screen that argues specifically about this. The idea is one is saved by putting one's allegiance in Christ. And this meshes with what Paul tells us humanity has been doing from, you know, ever since Adam and so on, which is we've been putting our allegiance, we've been giving our loyalty to the creation, to false gods and things like that. But what we need to do is be giving our, lawyer, our allegiance and loyalty to Jesus. Um, and so first off, I would say that this type of um, understanding of belief and faith as being belief in a specific thing that Jesus did for you or faith in a specific thing that Jesus did for you, understanding that in this way of a specific atonement model, I would think that doesn't actually mesh with what those, what those words mean. It doesn't mesh with how those people would have understood it. And it doesn't mesh with the things we see in scripture, like people being saved by their faith, even when Jesus hadn't died yet. So they couldn't have those conceptions of those things. And if he wants to try to make some argument of, oh, well, actually this woman or this um, centurion or whoever it is that Jesus says their faith has saved them, they actually somehow did have all this knowledge about what Jesus was going to do. I'm just going to say he has to back that up. If he's going to make the claim that pre-Jesus' death, these, these Gentiles, these people who, um, you know, they, they don't come from any type of theologically informed background, they just see Jesus, they hear him preaching, and they, they trust him, they put their, their loyalty, their allegiance in him. If you want to argue that they actually have this highly developed uh, theology, this highly developed doctrine of atonement even before Jesus dies, you're welcome to show that to me in scripture. You're not going to be able to. And so this is a huge issue in this guy's argument is whatever we mean by belief and faith, it can't, it can't be bundling in all these ideas that he's trying to bundle in here. But let's, let's see more of this idea that he expresses. And yeah, we know that if we don't trust that Jesus took the punishment for us, where do we end up? And how. Yeah, and so for yourself, do you think from today you're going to trust that the only reason you're going to heaven is because Jesus took the punishment for all of your sin? So let's pause here. So the only reason you're going to heaven, according to this guy, is because Jesus took all your punishment at the cross. And this is an idea that pops up several times in this video, and I've been letting it slide, but I'll go ahead and address it now. He has this conception of, oh, why can we go to heaven? What happens at the cross? It's all about what happens at the cross. That is not biblical. It's not just that that isn't supported. So there are some things I'll say this and this isn't supported by the Bible. This is flat out contradicted by the Bible. I've done some live streams after I put out my book where I'm trying to talk to people about what the Bible actually says about atonement and salvation. And one of the things I say to people and that I actually have this on, I have this on the blurb, I say, uh, you needed more than Jesus' death on the cross to be saved. You also needed a good lawyer. And people say, oh, you, need, you needed more than Jesus' death on the cross to be saved? You heretic, don't you think his one-time sacrifice is enough? Um, it's not that I don't think Jesus' sacrifice isn't enough. It's what your understanding of Jesus' sacrifice is. That's, you don't have an accurate understanding of that. So let me, let me explain this here. According to the Bible, the reason you are able to be saved to the uttermost, the prime most important reason you are able to be saved, you can go to heaven, according to the Bible, is because what Jesus does after he dies on the cross, okay? So any understanding you have 
of the atonement or what Jesus does for you that says, well, I can go to heaven because this thing on the cross, and, and this, is, this is the ultimate thing, this is why, is this thing that happened on the cross, that is not a biblical view of the atonement. And let me give you some examples, okay? So let's go ahead and pull up. All right, so we're going to be pulling up Romans, and this is chapter 8, verses 34, okay? So this is Paul. He says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Okay, so Paul says it's more important, Jesus, Jesus is dying, what's more important than that is that he's raised and he's interceding for us. So there's this idea of intercession in heaven by Christ that is more important than the fact that he died. Okay, now this is an idea that doesn't just pop up in Paul, okay? This pops up in, um, in Hebrews as well. So all throughout Hebrews, there is this idea that Christ passes through the heavens. He enters into the, the holy heavenly places, not made by human hands. And he enters that place, and he offers himself as a perfect sacrifice to the Father. He, he enters there through the means of his blood, all right? And there's this kind of parallel all throughout Hebrews of comparing what the high priest on earth does on earth in the earthly holy place and what Jesus, our high priest in the heaven, does when he goes into the heavens after his death and resurrection. And the idea in Hebrews is that we are able to be saved because Christ is now our high priest in heaven. Okay, so here's a verse for that. This is Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the other, uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Oh, look, there's that idea of intercession again, right? This verse goes on, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and those for those, for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. And no, that's not referring to the cross. That is referring to when he offers up himself by offering himself as a sacrifice in the most most holy place. Because in the Old Testament, when a, when a priest makes a sacrifice, they don't just kill an animal and boom, a sacrifice has been made. An animal is killed, the blood is collected, and that blood is taken into the sacred space. And on the day of Yom Kippur, the, um, the blood of the animal is taken into the most holy place, to the Ark of the Covenant, where I, I argue in my book, God himself is present there. And then the blood of that animal is laid, it is sprinkled down at the feet of God. It is sprinkled down on, on the Ark of the Lid of the Covenant. And it is that moment where that life of that animal is then being offered as a gift, as a sacrifice. That's what a sacrifice is. It is a gift given to God. That is when a sacrifice is made. And so if we are going to take seriously the parallels of Jesus that we're told about in Hebrews, explicitly in Hebrews 9, then whatever sacrifice it is he's offering as our high priest has to be in the most holy place, in the heavenly holy place that he entered into by, through the means of his blood. So he goes into this place, he offers himself up, he offers his own life, his own blood as a gift. And then he enters into this role of our eternal high priest. And that is what Hebrews says is the reason we're able to be saved. And all of that occurs after Jesus dies. Okay, so I, I cannot stress this enough. We are able to be saved to the uttermost because of things happening after Jesus died and resurrected. Those, these are things that are happening after he enters into heavens and he, he's exalted, right? He's exalted, he's, his, the enemies are made his footstool, he's exalted above all the other powers and principalities, all these things, he's made higher than any other name. All of this happens after his death and resurrection, and that's where the author of Hebrews says, this is why we can be saved. There's another verse similar to this in Hebrews. Let me bring it up. All right, so the other verse that I'm going to reference about this in Hebrews is going to be in um, Hebrews chapter 10. And actually, before I reference the verse that I was going to bring up, I want to reference another one regarding this idea of the sacrifice that Jesus makes being in heaven. So in Hebrews 10, 14, 
um, Hebrews 10, 10 through 14, um, we're told, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Okay, now where are they offering those sacrifices? They're offering those sacrifices in the tabernacle, in the temple, in the sacred space, okay? They're not offering those sacrifices outside where they're killing the animals, okay? And then verse 12, but when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, so a After he did that, offered a single sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God. So he offers the sacrifice. He offers the gift to God, and then he sits down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Then we see in Hebrews 10, 19 through 22, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let me go through that again. Why can we have full assurance of faith? Why can we draw near? Because we have a great priest over the house of God who unlike the high priest in the Old Testament who had to offer repeatedly multiple sacrifices and they couldn't stay there and they would die. We don't have a high priest like that. He entered once through the means of his own blood into the, holy, um, into the heavenly holy places. And once there, he never, he never dies. He never, he never has to leave. He's eternally present as our high priest and he is interceding for us. And because of that intercession, that is why we can be saved. That's why we can have a full assurance of faith. This is not consistent with the message that need God is putting forth and many Christians put forth of well the most important thing is that Jesus died Mm -mm. that's not the most important thing it's not the most important thing according to Hebrew it's not the most important thing according to Paul the most important thing according to the Bible is you have an intercessor in heaven and the enemy has been slapped down okay so let me bring up a verse about that because this is another theme regarding um, salvation that I I haven't been touching on this point, which is there is the idea that we are able to be saved or, or what our salvation is about is about destroying the works of the devil. We were captive to the devil. We were in the kingdom of darkness. Now we're in the kingdom of light, all right? So for this, let's go to Revelation 12 and we are gonna hop down to starting around verse seven. I'm gonna read from there, okay? So this is Revelation 12, we're gonna start at verse seven. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven, and saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, the earth, for now the devil has come down to you in great wrath and so on and so forth. But notice here, the salvation and the coming of the kingdom of our God and the, and the coming of our salvation, that is thematically connected with an accuser, Satan, being cast down. So we gained an, we gained an advocate in Jesus. We gained an intercessor and we lost an accuser. Our accuser who was standing there day and night accusing us, he's been cast down. He's been disbarred. That's why I named my book, The Devil's Disbarment. It's because he no longer has that place to accuse us. He's been defeated. And it is through that defeat that we are able to be saved. And there's this kingdom of, the, the, of, of God and the authority of Christ. And we're told that this comes about. How? By two things. By the blood of Christ and through the word of their testimony. Now, the blood of Christ, if we're taking Hebrew seriously, we know that this isn't just the mere fact that Jesus' blood was shed. It's the blood of Christ that has been taken into the heavens and has purified the heavens. And we know has been, has been sprinkled in the heavens and has been, um, I would say, laid, laid forth and put forth as a gift and as a sacrifice to the Father. Let me give you a, a quote from Hebrews on that front. 
Okay, so the idea, so I referenced a while ago um, Hebrews 9, how Hebrews 9 is where we see this really strong parallel between what Jesus does and what the high priest on earth does. So this is going to be Hebrews 9 starting in verses 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. This is coming right after it's talking about um, in the Old Testament the use of blood and purification in, um, in, under the law. So he, he talks about the Old Testament stuff. Stuff. And then the author of Hebrews says, thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, okay? So the heavens need to be purified with better sacrifices than this blood of bulls and goats stuff, okay? Now immediately after being told that, we're told, for Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, not the earthly tabernacle, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all, at the end of the ages, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So this idea of Christ offering the sacrifice of himself that is contextualized in Hebrew of happening when Jesus goes into the heavens, the things that the earthly tabernacles were copied off of, okay? And there's this idea of the heavens themselves had to be purified by, by better things than the blood of bulls and goats. And then verse 27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him, okay? Um, so I, I've, been, I've been kind of preaching for a minute here. Um, and I've been talking about this idea of, you know, Christ as sacrifice and what his blood does. The reason I bring up this section about, you know, the, the blood here in Hebrews 9 is Jesus' blood is important, okay? The most important thing about Jesus' blood is not just the fact that it was shed. It's not just the fact that the blood was shed. That's not how sacrifices work. Everybody go pick up Leviticus and read the, the sacrificial laws. It's not like, boom, animals been killed, blood has been shed, a sacrifice has been made, let's go get lunch. That's not how it happens. The killing of the animal is one step in the sacrificial process. And that sacrificial process culminates with the blood, with the life of the animal, which is in the blood, being offered to the deity, okay? That's what's going on with Jesus in heaven. That's, that's what this is about, okay? And all of this, all of this Jesus offering himself, offering his blood, all this stuff going on in heaven after he died and resurrected, all of that contributes to the conquering of Satan that we saw in Revelations 12, okay? Now, I just read a verse about um, Jesus appearing in heaven, um, being presented before God on our behalf, right? Now he's appearing in the presence of God on our behalf. That idea, that echoes what we see in Daniel 7, okay? So let's bring up Daniel 7. Um, those of you who are familiar with Daniel, you know that this is, this is a really big verse, right? This is um, the big throne room scene. So I'm going to start reading at Daniel 7, verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court set in judgment, and the books were opened. Okay, so I want to pause here. We get this, this glorious throne room scene of the Ancient of Days, okay? And it's, it's a courtroom scene. The court set in judgment, and books were opened, okay? And then after this, we are told, I saw in the night vision, and behold, like the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. We know this is Jesus. Jesus repeatedly calls himself the son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Hmm, kind of sounds a lot like Hebrews, huh? huh? And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed, okay? So what we see here is a connection between this son of man is presented before the father and then he's given this authority. And we're told all of this immediately after we are told 
that there's this court sitting in judgment. And that idea of the court sitting in judgment, that pops up again later in Daniel 7. So we're told about um, these beasts who come up and they're rebellious. And we're told um, about this very specific um, beast, I think it's the, the little horn, who he is, is rebelling. And so we're going to go down here to Daniel 7. This is 25. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the law and they shall be given into his hand for a time, a time times, and half a time. But the court shall sit in judgment. Okay, again, there's a, there's a judgment in the heavens going on. And his dominion shall be taken away. So there's a dominion being taken away from the beast or the horn or whatever it is here. Um, and that, that dominion is taken away from him because of the judgment of the court. And that kingdom and that dominion is then given to the son of man. Okay, so this is courtroom language. This is the conquering of Satan, the conquering of the devil, like we saw in Revelation, that is coming about in this courtroom scenario. And what happens in a courtroom? Okay, you have accusations being made. We already saw that that happened in Revelation 12. And you have people who defend those accused. And we've already seen that Jesus intercedes for us in the heavens, right? He's our intercessor. So what I'm trying to convey here is that this entire framework, so it's not, there are two problems with this uh, needs God, uh, need God's view. Not only is he, is he taking uh, minor doctrines and making them salvational issues, like even if I thought he was 100% right about penal substitution, I would still be, I would still be critiquing him on this, right? Because like these, how we understand these things aren't what's the most important. Not only is he making minor issues, salvation issues, is he's not even getting the minor issues that he's exalting right. He's butchering them. Salvation is about the conquering of Satan. It's about the intercession of Jesus. And all of this, or the significant lion's share of this, comes about um, after Jesus' death and resurrection. If you want to say, well, I've got a whole lot of questions now about how that all works. I mean, um, what about this? What about that? What about Isaiah 53? What about Romans 3? What about, um, I thought Jesus, I thought sacrifice in the Old Testament were all about punishment. Wait, why would God need to do this whole song and dance? If you have all those questions, I'm not going to get into that here. Check out my book, The Devil's Disbarment, in which I articulate and I develop what I call a divine counsel model of the atonement. I think you're going to like it. Okay, let me finish up this video. I know I've been going on a bit about atonement. Let me finish this up by making a few more critiques on some of the things that this guy says. Actually, before I move on, one point that I forgot to address, I'm adding this in now in editing, is he says multiple times in his video that um, you have to believe that Jesus was punished for your sins. This idea of God punished Jesus with the punishment that should have been yours. Like this is, you know, you have to believe this or you're going to hell. Not only does that have all the problems that I just mentioned, which is this ignoring the stuff that Jesus does after the cross, is the idea that God punished Jesus for your sins that God poured out on Jesus' punishment that was supposed to be yours, you, there's nowhere in the Bible that supports that. There's not a single verse that supports that. And I know if you're a penal substitution advocate and you hold to this view, I know all the verses you're about to try to cite at me. I know Romans 3. I know um, all the Leviticus chapters about Jesus being a sin offering. I know um, Isaiah 53. I know all those. I address those in my book, okay? So I'm just going to briefly address one aspect of Isaiah 53, because this is what people like to throw at me. Your best case, the best argument you have for saying that God punished Jesus on the cross is to go to Isaiah 53 and to cite the section that says, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And, upon, and with his wounds were here, healed. Now I'm actually just going to read to you guys a section from my book where I specifically address this, okay? So some translations render this verse with punishment instead of chastisement, which renders the argument for penal substitutionary atonement even stronger. If the verse says our punishment was upon him and this brought us peace, what else is left to say? Well, it turns out quite a lot. Let us begin by looking at the word translated as chastisement or punishment. This word does not carry the meaning that penal substitution needs it to. As John Golden Gay notes, quote, the word punishment, musar, is not a legal one, but suggests the chastisement of a child or a student by a parent or a teacher in order to teach a lesson. He gets beaten like a child or a student so that other people may learn from it. So that's from John Golden Gay's Isaiah commentary. Similarly, uh, Klaus Baltzer remarks, chastisement, rebuke, or correction is a term in wisdom teaching. The basic meaning of the root is probably instruct. Branson sums up the primary purpose of instruction, Yasar, 
is to communicate knowledge in order to shape specific conduct. The verb you saw often appears with the meaning correct, i.e. instruct someone by using punishment to correct what has been done. Um, now, penal substitutionary advocates like to point to the punishment, musar, upon the servant as evidence that retributive justice is being executed and that wrath is being poured out. However, the word does not necessarily carry that meaning and is used in more remedial ways. This word is used to convey a father's instruction in Proverbs 1, 8 and 4, 1, and is, one is encouraged to pursue it at any price. We see that in Proverbs 8, 10. Those who do not receive musar are described as stiff-necked. We see that in Jeremiah 17, 23. In fact, the lack of of Musar brings death in Proverbs 5.23. However, this word is not exclusively warm and fuzzy. The term is also used in ways that resemble the thinking of penal substitutionary advocates. So for instance, Hosea 5.2, Jeremiah 30, 12 through 17. However, um, and this here is a quote from, who is this? This is the uh, Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament on the entry of this word, okay? Their names are a little bit difficult to pronounce. So it's jo- Johannes Bottlereck and R.D. Branson from the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, which is a fantastic reference work when it comes to word studies. I highly recommend people reference it. It says, in most cases, Musar is redemptive when it comes as Yahweh's punishment. It is intended to restore the one on whom it is inflicted to proper conduct. Yahweh expects that Israel will learn from everything experienced and suffered at the time of the exodus and wilderness wanderings and that they will be true to the covenant. He references Deuteronomy 11.2. Nevertheless, Jeremiah 2.30 and 5.3 shows that the people remained disobedient even when Yahweh multiplied their anguish with repeated discipline. So can this understanding of Musa be used in Isaiah 53? Yes, I think it can. I'm going to stop there. So I've been reading up to my book um, up to this point. I'm going to stop there. If, if you want more details on other things in Isaiah 53, I'm just going to say check my book out. But to put short here, your best attempt at getting this punishment position is that verse in Isaiah 53. Like that's, that's the best thing you guys have, and it doesn't get you there. That's not the word that is used and sometimes translated as punishment. It just doesn't have this con- connotation of a, a legal retributive, you know, you did something bad and I'm, I have to punish you in this legal sense. It's not going to get you there. Um, okay, so with that said, let's go on to the next clip. Um, what about in the book of Matthew when it says, you know, people who have prophesied in my name, you know, casted out demons in my name, but yeah. in the day of the judgment, they're going to say, depart from me, for, depart mm-hmm. from me, for I never knew you. How would you explain that? Because I would say clearly those people believed since they prophesied and they cast out demons in his name so clearly they believed what didn't they so but he's great great part. point thing is this thing is though is that look at what they're pointing to is the reason why they should be led into heaven what are they pointing to well for saying that they prophesied in his name and cast out demons in his name yeah and then so they're looking to their works. works in his name Right. So they're looking to what they have done as the basis of their acceptance before God. They're not looking to the promise of Jesus and Jesus dying on the cross Mm -hmm. to pay for their sin. They're looking to look at me. I've done this. I've done that. That's why they were told depart from me, Mm -hmm. which is why if we think that we have to do good works to go to heaven, we'll be the people who hear the words depart from me. I never knew you. Which is why I'm glad we're talking because I don't want you to be someone who's going to hear those words. Yeah. Okay, so this is a massive misrepresentation of Matthew 7, and it low-key infuriates me. It high-key infuriates me. Because, so, okay, so this guy's argument is, oh, look at Matthew 7. So they come to him, and they say, Lord, Lord, um, we, we did all these things in your name. We did X, Y, Z. And he says, oh, well, Jesus says, depart from me. And why does Jesus say, depart from me? Oh, well, it's because they were trusting in their works. Well, so several problems here. So let's first analyze that claim. There is nothing in here to suggest that they think that they should be saved because of their works. Rather, if, if faith and belief is allegiance, it's loyalty, then they could be saying, "Hey, listen, we're loyal to you. Look at all this thing we look at all these things we did for you." They could be pointing to those things as evidence of their loyalty, as evidence of their allegiance. So, first off, and this is like this is the minor issue. There's a much bigger issue with this guy's argument. Is he's just way too quick 
to jump to this being, oh, well, they're, they're, they're damned because they trusted in their good works. That's not evident from the passage. But here's where the big, major, honking issue in this guy's argument is. Let's read that verse. So Jesus says, depart from me, for I never knew you. Okay? So the reason that they are, are being sent away is because they did not, they did not know Jesus. And immediately after he says this, he accuses them of being workers of lawlessness. So need God, how is it that you're going to point to this verse as evidence? And I'm not even saying, like, I'm not even advocating for work-based salvation. That's not even what I'm, I'm going for here. That's not even my point. My point is this guy is just butchering scripture. And it's like, this is, this is a false, this is like, I, I'm reluctant to use the word false teacher, but when you have someone who is, is cutting off half of what Jesus said to make his point, and the later point directly contradicts him, contradicts him it's really difficult for me not to want to call this guy a false teacher. And, and I'm not doubting his salvation. I think he's really, truly saved. But he is objectively teaching things that are false, and it seems like he's distorting the scripture. So need God, why did you cut off half of what Jesus said there? Because they come, they said, hey, Jesus, we did all this stuff in your name. Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. Jesus cites their works as evidence. Jesus cites their works in his condemnation. So how is need God going to say that this is a verse which somehow undercuts any need for us to be conscious of the works we're doing? It's nonsense. I mean, I, I have to believe that when Need God sat down and he read this verse, I have to believe he read the full thing. I have to believe he saw Jesus specifically mention their works of lawlessness. So why is he going to this verse to make this point? Why is he not quoting the full passage? That's a question only he can answer. And I hope he sees this in response to this. Because again, I'm not saying he's not a Christian. He's a brother in Christ. I'm very... I think I will see him in heaven and on the new earth. He probably doesn't think he's going to see me on the new earth and in the new heaven because I don't hold a penal substitution, despite the fact that, as I explained in my book, it's not biblical. Um, but I, I think I will see him in heaven, so I'm not, I'm not saying he's damn. But what I'm saying is he is not dealing with the scripture appropriately. He's not taking in full context of these verses. He's, when he's constructing his theology of the atonement, he is not taking into account the entirety of scripture. He's not taking into account what Paul says about intercession. He's not taking into account what Hebrew says about intercession, what Hebrew says about what goes on in the heavens afterwards. He's not taking into account what Jesus himself says to people saying, your faith has saved you. When the thing that they did that was a display of their faith was them being loyal and obedient and serving Jesus. Take this seriously because I know that if you hold on to your works, mm -hmm. if you hold on to what the Orthodox Church says, they think baptism is needed for salvation. They think the Eucharist is needed for salvation. And they think also um, confession to a priest is needed for salvation. Mm -hmm. And they also think there's only salvation in the Orthodox Church, nowhere else. Yeah. I think if somebody holds on to those things, they themselves won't be saved because they're not putting full trust into Jesus to get them into heaven. They're saying, I've had to do these extra things. Lord, Lord, I went to the Eucharist. I took the Eucharist. I went to the priest and Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> when you put it like that, it's really concerning. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And that's why I, I, yeah, I really care about you. I really don't want you to hold on to those Orthodox beliefs. Yeah. Okay, so this is something I want to pause here real quick. This is something I see Protestants do a lot. Protestants are so eager to point a finger and say, you do work-based salvation. They are so eager to say that, that they just make stuff up. Like, they, like I'm not... Now, I'm not saying he's making stuff up about the importance of the Eucharist and baptism and things like that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying accusing this of being work-based salvation, like creating a model of understanding of works where this fits into work-based salvation. Say, like, oh, this is work-based salvation. Protestants are so quick to make this accusation against people, it doesn't even make sense. Like, let, let me give an example with this guy. Orthodox and Catholics, for instance, Orthodox, let's say you think no one who um, is, isn't baptized is saved, okay? Let's say you hold to that position. There's no universe in which that is work-based salvation, okay? Work-based salvation 
if we're going to understand it in its, its biblical context, what does Paul mean when he says it's not by works? The idea of work-based salvation and why it's rejected in Scripture is the idea that you can earn something, that through your good works you are earning salvation. Okay, That's the idea that's condemned. It's not the idea that in order for you to experience eternal life, you have to do something. Even this guy, even Need, uh, need God on his website, he notes that you have to make a choice to trust in God. Our Calvinist brothers and sisters would say, oh, this is work-based salvation. You've got to do something. You've got to make the decision to trust. Well, like th- that's silly. That's not the idea of work that's going on here. And so if, you, if someone says, listen, I, I don't think, uh, if someone thinks no one's saved who isn't baptized, the re- they can cast out out in a way where it doesn't commit them to saying that, um, uh, that baptism somehow earns their salvation. So for instance, if we ask what's going on with baptism, like what's that whole thing about? Baptism is a public proclamation of whose side you're on. Baptism is a public proclamation of are you siding with Yahweh? Are you siding with Jesus? Or are you siding with the devil? Are you siding with the, the creation rather than the creator? And we're explicitly told to be, um, are we, we're explicitly told to be baptized. So here's the thing. Can someone say, I'm obedient to God, I'm faithful to Jesus, I'm loyal to God, and I'm gonna disobey him when he tells me to get baptized? Is that loyalty? Is that allegiance? Is that trusting God? Is that being obedient to him? If someone is willfully refusing to publicly proclaim whose side they're on, if they're refusing to do something God has directly told them to do, can we say that they are actually following Christ? No. Now, if it's, it's one thing if they're like, they're about to die and they don't have the opportunity, but they, sh- they sure would have liked to. That's not what I'm talking about here. We're talking about, can someone willfully disobey God on this command and still, and still be, be referred to as a Christian? My inclination is to say that person isn't actually loyal to God. They're actually not trusting and following Christ. That doesn't mean I think baptism earns anything. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm holding to some type of work-based salvation. That's silly. Baptism isn't earning me anything. It's not some good work that, you know, levels up my merit. But it's rather, if I don't do that, then I'm showing I'm not really, I really don't have faith. And so there is a connection here that guys like need God, they're just not, they're so quick to try to point the finger at someone and say, oh, you're doing work-based salvation, that they, they fail to cash out the nuances of, okay, what do we mean by work-based salvation? Is what we mean by work-based salvation what the apostles meant by work-based salvation? And if one thinks that the Eucharist, baptism, yada, yada, if one thinks that those things you know, have to be performed in order for one to be saved, does that constitute this definition of work-based salvation that we've articulated? And I don't, I don't think it does. So I think this is just sloppy on needs God part. And I think that if he had, I, I don't know this gentleman, I don't know his background, I don't know his education. From just listening to him, I think he probably, and I could be wrong, um, I just think he probably isn't really delved into the nuances of some of these theological issues. Like these discussions about baptism or there's more than meets the eye here. So let me read to you a quote from, from Jesus, okay? This is Jesus. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Well, okay, now Jesus says, whoever does X and Y will be saved. Listen, if somebody reads that and they're saying, okay, Jesus told me to do X and Y, I need to go do X and Y, According to need God, they're going to hell. No, seriously, like need God thinks that if they think, they read this verse, that by the way, that verse was in Mark um, 16, 16 and also in Luke 171. Um, If somebody reads this and they say, well, okay, Jesus told me to be saved, I need to believe and be baptized. So I I guess, I don't know, that that verse in isolation, if, if, if that's what they're reading, and they say, oh, okay, well, hmm, that kind of seems like I need to be saved, even if they're wrong, okay, even if they're completely misinterpreting it. They're not going to be damned for coming to that conclusion, dude. You know, like, I, Christians have to stop making mountains out of molehills. We have to, 
Do you worship a God who is generous or do you worship a God who is stingy? Do you seriously think God is sitting in heaven just looking at every single interpretation of every verse and if we get something wrong, he's like, damned, damned. Like, do you think we have to get a perfect score on the theology scorecard? Let me ask this. Do you think God is looking for reasons to damn us or do you think he's looking for reasons to save us? Because the picture I get from Jesus and from the Bible as a whole is God's not looking for the smallest little pedantic thing that he can fault us on. God's not looking for, oh, you got this thing about baptism wrong, damn. God's looking, he's, he, he looks at the woman who comes and she, she gives her two pennies. Or he looks at the, the centurion who comes and says, I, I also am a man who has men under me and of authority. I know if you say this, it'll be done. He's looking at the woman who comes and washes Jesus' feet. He looks at these people and he says, yep, that's, 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 that's it. That's loyalty. That's what I'm looking for. And so, so I, I don't want to ramble on this point, but it's really, we have to, I, I just, I want to have a conversation with me, God, and be like, do you really think God is looking to damn people to the point that if somebody messes up, if somebody reads like that verse that I just read from Mark, we're, I mean, a, a, a plausible first, a, a plausible first look at this could lead one to think that baptism is needed for salvation. Do you really think God left that in the Bible, knowing how that could appear? And there's everyone who, who essentially doesn't get the apparent trick question of in, interpreting this verse. He's just damning them all. Ah, what a weird view of God. I'm so thankful that the God I worship is, is, is looking for reasons to save me. He's, he's not looking, he's not trying to find the smallest little thing that he can have an excuse to damn me. I'm so glad that apparently I just I just have a different conception of God than than need God does. So okay, I've been rambling on that point a little bit. Let me see if there's any other um, thing I wanted to address in here. But just like in a court of law, if you say to a judge, "Judge, I'm so sorry for my crimes. Please forgive me and let me go," would the judge let you go free? Um. No. No, that's the same with God. No amount of asking Him will ever get us forgiveness. So this is just one of those areas where I'm like, man, are we just reading different Bibles? I mean, just the other day, I did a live stream with uh, my friend Than at Exploring Reality and Ryan Mullins, um, specifically on, I think it's Mark 9, with the healing of the paralytic, where Jesus says, uh, what's easier, for me to say to this man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, you know, get up and walk? But so that you can know that I have the authority to do this, um, get up and walk. And he does this to show the people, I can forgive sins. I have that authority. And if you don't think that God can forgive sins, well, then the Old Testament, I mean, boy, somebody should have told that to the Old Testament writers. Because all throughout the Old Testament, we get this idea of God can just forgive sins. Second Chronicles 7.14 God says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Um, Nehemiah 9.17, but you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and and did not forsake them. Uh, Psalm 32 uh, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Um, Psalm 32, 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Psalm 85, 2, you forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Psalm 86, 5, for you, O Lord, are good and forgiving. Psalm 99, 8, O Lord, our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them. Psalm 103, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Uh, Psalm 134, uh, 130 verse 4, but with you there is forgiveness that you may be, fe- that you may be feared. All throughout the Old Testament, we get the idea that, that God is ready to forgive us. And that's just in the Psalms. I can go outside that. In uh, Jonah, God's anger is against Nineveh. He's about to pour out his wrath on them. He's about to punish them. But they repent, and and God relents from their disaster he was going to bring upon them. He forgives them. In Ezekiel 22, 29 through 31, God says, The people of the land have practiced extortion and have committed robbery. They've oppressed the poor and needy and have extorted from the sojourner without justice. And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. 
Hmm, that's interesting. That almost sounds like intercession. But I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. I have returned their ways upon their heads, declares the Lord God. In this passage, all that was needed to avert the wrath of God upon the land was for somebody to stand in the breach and intercede for the people. God didn't have to punish these guys. God did not want to punish these guys. Similarly, in Jeremiah 5, God says he would pardon Jerusalem if he could find a single innocent person, but he couldn't. God then goes on to talk about how he's going to punish them and destroy them for their sins. However, God says in Jeremiah 18 that any time he says to a city that he's going to destroy it, he will relent from the disaster if they just turn from their wicked ways. In Isaiah 6, the prophet sees into the divine counsel, and he says, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for in this passage, guilt is taken away. Sin is atoned for because the hot coal touched his lips. We see something similar in Zechariah 3. Um, we see uh, it say, Now Joshua was standing before the angel, this is the angel of the Lord, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And this passage, forgiveness of sin, is associated with a wardrobe change, not punishment, not any idea of God just saying, oh, no, can't go doing that. That would be unjust. That's not the conception we get of God in the Old Testament. So if you think that we shouldn't ask for forgiveness because God's hands are just tied and he can't, well, I, I guess Need God knows more about all of this than the psalmist. I guess, I guess Need God needs to write his own Bible because what we see in the Old Testament is just not consistent with what he's saying. Um, I, I don't think Need God can hold to this position and actually hold to any form of uh, biblical inerrancy, which I know Need God takes seriously because I've heard him talk about that. So, okay, that's my, um, that's my real final thing. I'm going to bring it to a close. It's 1 a.m. as I'm finishing this up, and church is tomorrow, so I uh, might be a little too sleepy for the sermon. But um, thankfully, I don't have to rely on good works, and you know, good works is you know, being fully conscious in a sermon, right? Anyways, everybody have a good night. Um, I'm going to link a, a leave a link to my book in the um, in the description of this if people want to check it out. It's going to be free on Kindle Unlimited for, I think, the next month or so, and then it's going to be taken off Kindle Unlimited, but the, it's always going to be available on, on Amazon. Um, I plan for it always to be available on Amazon even after it goes off Kindle Unlimited. So you can get a paperback or an ebook copy. Um, if you've been interested in the stuff I talk about in this video, I, I recommend you check it out. Everybody have a good day or night or afternoon, morning, whatever it is where you're at.